Hi, welcome to this lesson that I've entitled a wireless networking primer. So I'm trying to give you a, a general overview of actually 802.11 networking. We'll talk more about that in a little bit so that you can get, a, get enough background to help you as we begin to look at some of the security uh, issues relating to 802.11 wireless. So let's see what we do today. Okay, so to kind of start out as an introduction, um, wireless networking standards allow you to send packets wirelessly, which makes sense, I guess. Um, and there's a variety of different standards that are used for different purposes. So there's standard Wi-Fi, like your laptop connection. Um, there's the cell network connections from your mobile phone, things like um, uh, 2G, 3G, 4G. Um, there's low-speed serial connections, um, things like Zigbee, etc., uh, etc. Cetera, et cetera. So there's a lot of different standards for wireless communication. But today, we're going to focus on Wi-Fi, which is 802.11. And so 802.11, the number itself, is actually just the number assigned to the standard by the IEEE. So when the IEEE was standardizing 802.11, uh, that was just the number that they used. So it, it's, it doesn't have any intrinsic meaning, the numbering. It's just a choice of the numbering of the standard. And the best way and easiest way to think of 802.11 is, is kind of as a wireless form of Ethernet. What I mean by that is that wireless packets are still addressed using the MAC addresses of devices. It's just in this case, it's the MAC address of your wireless card instead of, of an Ethernet card, for example. But functionally, it operates in a very similar way. Now, normally, clients send and receive traffic from a wireless access point. Um, that isn't always the case. You can run Wi-Fi in like an ad hoc mode or something, but those are really rarely used. So we're not gonna talk uh, about it that much in this course. Um, all data when you're dealing with Wi-Fi is transmitted using radio waves, which makes sense. The only reason I bring it up here is because there are other wireless standards that use other techniques. Um, like uh, I've heard there's wireless standards for laser, uh, there's other things as well, but radio waves is what we're talking about with 802.11. And there's different flavors of 802.11, which we're going to talk about in just a second. And they use different frequencies and have different throughputs, and underneath there's actually very different ways that they transmit the information but we'll talk over the parts that are relevant for us in just a moment. Well, so let's talk about some terminology related to 802.11 Wi-Fi. Uh, first is what's called an SSID, which stands for Service Set Identifier, and it's just the name of the wireless network. So as an example here at QU, one of the names of one of our wireless networks is QU User. It's just the name of the network. And you know, when you're using your machine, you're looking for a wireless network, the names that show up, that's the SSID for each network. Another term called the BSSID, Basic Service Set Identifier, uh, which sounds complicated, but is really just the MAC address of the access point that you're connecting to. They just call that the BSSID in the standard. Uh, another piece of terminology would be a station. A uh, station is a client device that connects to the wireless network, like your laptop, or if your phone has Wi-Fi, it could be your phone. Any device that connects to the 802.11 network, we call that a station. And another good piece of terminology to know is an access point. Now these are hardware devices that stations connect to. So if you think about a traditional Wi-Fi deployment, your laptop would be a station and your wireless router would be the access point. Okay, so a, a basic 802.11 network looks something like this. We might have multiple stations uh, and they would be connected to the access point and the access point would have a connection to the internet. This might be something you would have set up at home. Uh, so if station one wants to send a packet to the internet, well, it takes its packet and it sends it to the access point, and then the access point goes ahead and, for goes ahead and forwards it to the internet, just like you would expect, and vice versa. Packets coming back would go back, would go across that same path. Now, if station one wants to send a packet to station two, well, that goes, also goes through the access point. Packet goes to the access point and then goes down to station two. And the only reason I bring that up is because in intuitively, there's not necessarily a reason it would have to go through the access point. You know, if you just think wirelessly, station, would could send, station one could send its packet directly to station two. Um, but it doesn't. In, in a traditional 802.11 environment, it sends its traffic through the access point. So all of the traffic ends up going through the access point in a standard network. Okay, so there's different flavors of 802.11, and I've picked four of them here. Uh, that are probably the most relevant to discuss. So the first is 802.11b, um, which ironically you may not remember depending on your age. 
Uh, and its max throughput was 11 megabits per second, and it ran on a frequency of 2.4 gigahertz. 2.4 gigahertz, there's kind of a range in that frequency that it makes use of. Uh, it was chosen just because it was, um, it was allocated in the U.S. and Europe originally as free spectrum. Anybody could use it as long as they use it in low power situations. So the original standard, 802.11b, uh, was 11 megabits per second, ran on 2.4 gigahertz. Uh, after a while, people decided they needed more than just 11 megabits per second, uh, and so the 802.11g standard was standardized, ran on the same frequency, and it had a max throughput of 54 megabits. So significantly better, you know, five times faster than 802.11b. Uh, and then 802.11n followed that, and that ran across two different frequencies, 2.4 gigahertz and 5 gigahertz. 5 gigahertz was another set of frequencies that was opened up for public use. Uh, and this time we got a big bump in throughput, and that was 600 megabits per second. So 802.11n was kind of a, a big step forward, um, and it just gave us significantly more speed. And then most recently, and still finishing up in the standardization process, is 802.11's AC, uh, which runs solely on the 5 gigahertz frequency and has a max throughput of 866.7 megabits per second. Now, usually an access point that you have will support multiple or all of these. So if you, if you go out and you buy the latest and greatest 802.11 AC router, it will probably support G, N, and AC all simultaneously. So a client that only supports G can connect, a client that only supports N can connect, or a client that supports AC could connect, you know, as an example. So it's not uncommon at all to get access points that support multiple flavors of the standard at the same time. And all of them are designed to kind of work simultaneously so that you could have that environment specifically. Now I want to add, add a couple of notes. You notice I put a star here next to N and AC's throughput. Um, N and AC both support multiple streams, meaning that uh, you can get 600 megabits per second on N from one stream and you could run two streams at the same time if your devices have multiple antennas. And the same thing for AC. So that's a way that throughput can go even higher. So actually, for example, on, on AC, uh, I've seen routers advertise that if you have the right number of antennas on your router and on your client, you can get up to uh, 1,900 megabits per second, which that is significantly more um, <laughs> than, you know, the original of 11, and it, it's just, that's just a lot of speed. Another note I want to add is that all these throughputs are a theoretical max, and the likelihood that you'll ever see those speeds is very, very low. So these are the max theoretical throughput, but in practice, because it's wireless, you'll have some interference or lost packets, et cetera, et cetera, and so your actual throughput will be lower than the max throughput. Okay, so within those frequencies that I mentioned, both the 2.4 gigahertz and the 5 gigahertz range, um, there are different channels. So as an example, in that 2.4 gigahertz range, there are 14 different channels. And your Wi-Fi access point chooses, or it's, or it's configured to use, specific channels within that range. And the idea there is that by using different channels, you can have different access points in the same area and avoid interference because it's, it's radio. If, if everybody's transmitting on exactly the same frequency, everybody's going to interfere. So within these, these levels of spectrum, there is channels allocated that are all on slightly different frequencies so that you can run multiple access points and stations at the same time and not have significant interference. Okay, so one thing about 802.11 and, and all of the types we just talked about is that there are certain types of control frames, which are similar to what you just think of as a normal packet, and they're used to kind of control and set up the 802.11 connection. And we're going to talk through some of those now, and the reason is that we'll talk through them now because later they'll be important when we talk about security issues in 802.11. And these control frames are sent between access points and stations, you know, as they set up and as they maintain their connection. Uh, by default, None of these control frames are authenticated in any way. And this is important for you to think about because you know, we've talked about the, the importance of authentication or of authenticating frames. And in this case, by authenticated, I mean there's no integrity protection on the control frames. And in fact, the only useful way that we could really think about applying integrity protection to the control frames would be cryptographically. You know, if there was some sort of signature on the frames to verify that they came from the access point or from um, the station. But we'll, we'll look at the problem that this causes, the fact that there is no authentication slash integrity 
um, in, in, a, in a future lecture. Okay, so the first type of control frame I want to talk about is called a beacon frame. And a beacon frame is sent periodically by the access point to identify itself to prospective stations. It kind of advertises itself. So the layout of a beacon frame looks something like this. You have a timestamp that shows you know, what time the beacon frame was sent, the capabilities of the access point, things like what security settings it handles, et cetera, et cetera, uh, the SSID of the access point, the name, the data rates that the access point supports, and then maybe other information, um, other things that are included but aren't really relevant here. And typically, uh, an access point sends out a beacon frame once every second. So this is used, yeah, about every second in order to advertise itself. And the reason that access points do this is so that stations can, you know, when you, when you open up your laptop and you go down and you click on the wireless icon and, and you click on the wireless icon and it brings up a list of access points, that list is from your, your wireless card in your laptop listening for beacon frames just to see what access points are around. So this is a, a convenience feature so that stations can quickly and easily find nearby access points. So another type of control frame is a probe request frame. And this is sent by a station when it's looking for wireless networks specifically. So some stations might not send beacon frames. Um, you can configure them not to, so they don't advertise themselves. But uh, you would want a station to specifically try and connect to that access point if it's around. So if an access point receives a probe request frame, it usually responds with a probe response frame. And a probe response frame is almost identical to a beacon frame. They're almost the exact same thing. An important thing about probe request frames is that they're named. And named means that uh, a station can ask for an access point using a specific SSID. So my laptop might come up and it might immediately send a probe request frame saying, hey, is there an access point out there named QU user? And if there is, it'll respond back. And oftentimes that's used um, so that uh, you can quickly find preferred networks, for example. So a third type of control frame is an authentication frame. And uh, we're gonna do this one, and the next one is an, is an association frame, and well, they're similar but different. So in an authentication frame, a station requests to connect to an access point. And if web encryption is used on the network, which we'll talk about in a future lecture, then a cryptographic exchange occurs here to verify that the station and the access point share the same cryptographic key. But if we're not using web encryption, then there is no extra level of crypto magic here. So basically the station requests to connect and the access point replies with yes or no. It's just a station requesting permission to connect. And the access point says yes, you have permission, or no, you don't have permission. So the station is, in a sense, authenticating to the access point in order to get its request. So after an authentication request, uh, we have what's called an association request frame. And this is where the station requests a full connection to the access point. So the access point, if it approves the connection before in the authentication frame, will just connect the station to the network. It's basically just a way for both sides to allocate their resources for that. In order to send an association request frame, a station needs to have already completed authentication. And if you're using WPA or WPA, WPA2 security mechanisms, then those are verified right after the association occurs. And again, we'll talk about those two types of security mechanisms in a future lecture. Now, at this point, a lot of people usually stop and they say, well, why do we have an, an authentication request frame which simply says, am I allowed to connect, followed by an association request frame where I say, okay, I actually do want to connect. It seems like you could merge those together, right? Have one frame that you send that says, connect me, and the access point either says yes or no. Um, the only reason for the split is, I, I think, and this is where I'm hypothesizing, um, I think the split is because an authentication request frame uh, when you're using WEP includes some cryptographic magic in there to help make sure that the access point and the station uh, share that cryptographic key, whereas the association request is there afterwards and doesn't involve that. Uh, another good reason for it is that when you authenticate, you're authenticating to the network, as a, to the SSID as a whole, but an association is to a specific access point. And the only reason that comes up is for roaming. So if you're walking around Qatar University, for example, and we have multiple access points scattered around a building, your, your laptop, for example, when it moves out of range of one access point, will associate with the next one, 
but it might not have to authenticate with the next one first. It can just associate. So authentication may only need to occur once for the overall connection, but association occurs to every access point. That's just a few of the differences, but to be honest, it's fuzzy to me as to why we need both an authentication request frame and an association request frame. So another uh, frame, and this one's my favorite, is a disassociation frame. And this is just sent to terminate the connection. So it indicates, I'm done talking with you. And either side can send this. So the station can send it to the access point, or the access point can send it to the station to just say, I'm done. I'm not going to communicate anymore. It's similar in concept to a fin packet in TCP. And you send this to be polite. So the idea is, well, I know that I'm going to be done. You know, for example, I'm a laptop and someone just closed my lid. So I'm going to be polite to the access point and inform it that I'm done talking so that it will free up the resources it was using to maintain my connection. Um, if you don't send a disassociation frame, then eventually the other party will just time out and will free up the resources then. So it's just there to be polite. Okay, so let's do a connection scenario between a station and an access point that involves a number of these frames. Uh, this is just one scenario. There's lots of ways this could happen, but here's a good general one. And we're going to assume an open, no encryption network. Okay, so initially the access point is sending broadcast frames, you know, once per second that just say, hi, I am whatever my name is, coffee Wi-Fi. That's its SSID. Then the station decides it wants to connect and says, and it sends an authentication frame basically saying, am I allowed to connect to coffee Wi-Fi? And the access point, because this is an open Wi-Fi, says, yes, you're allowed. So the station says, well, I want to connect to Coffee Wi-Fi. And this is an association request frame. And the access point says, OK. And then they exchange data packets for the session. Because at step five, when the access point said OK, it, it, it formally added you know, entries to its own routing tables, et cetera, et cetera, to, for the station. So this cause the connection to succeed. And so now down in step six, we're just exchanging data for the session. And let's say that when we're done, um, step seven, say, well, the station says, I'm done, and sends a disassociation frame to the access point, who then terminates the connection. So that's just a sample way that these control frames are used. So let's sum up what we just talked about. First, 802.11 is a main standard for wireless communication. Um, and it's, you know, it's, it's Wi-Fi. You, you use it everywhere. And it has varying substandards like B, G, N, and AC that specify different frequencies, speeds, etc. Uh, it also has a set of control frames that are used to configure and maintain the connection between an access point and the stations that it's controlling. And really importantly, these control frames are not authenticated, and meaning that they also have no integrity. So emphasize that again, because we're going to come back to this a little bit later. There is no integrity on those control frames. So integrity, not. So keep that in mind as we move forward.